All right, Eric, do you have a Star Trek trivia for us? I do. Cool. Here it is. What was the name of Harry Mudd's shrewish wife? Probably going to get some, uh, I don't know. Is that is that PC? Can I call <laughs> wives shrewish? Uh, Ruth, Janice, Stella, or Edith? And this is why you never grow as a person. Hardcore Fenton Mud? It's like, here's a card. By the way, eat this Breedle. Welcome to a piece of the action. I am Micah. I'm Eric. And I'm Greg. And today we are going to get right into a, a review of another very popular game. This is the board game Scythe, and uh, this game came out in 2016 uh, by designer uh, Jeremy Stegmeier. Is that right, guys? Jamie, Jamie, Jamie Stegmeier. Jamie Stegmeier. And I had it on the other page and didn't look at it. I thought I could remember over the course of like four seconds what the name was, but I was wrong. So, um, And uh, I know you, it seems like you guys have a, Eric, especially you have a special fondness for Psy. <laughs> I, I do, think. yeah. Uh, I do have a special fondness for Psy. Uh, so we it's can... not my favorite game of all time, but it's the one I've spent the most money on. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, have, I don't, I, I don't, I almost never like what they call bling out any of my games i don't get any any specialty special stuff for it but I, I i think you should also mention that this is this is jamie stegmeier's game but it's inspired heavily inspired by jacob what was his last name greg um i should get uh jacob the, the jacob rizalski rizalski his his art inspired this game so stegmeier saw this the art and he was like we need to turn this into a board game and so Jakob has done all the art for it, so he, and uh, and kind of the world building behind it, um, and that's really the reason that I wanted to spend the extra money on this. I I have it's such a beautiful game that I wanted to you know make it get all all the things. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, once once I once I started down that path as the completionist that I am, I had to I had to catch them all. Okay. All right. Well, I I think we'll give you uh, give you lots of opportunities as we go through to expound upon. Uh, all the all the cool doodads that you bought. Uh, but Eric, why don't, uh, since you mentioned, that's interesting, you mentioned world building for a board game. Uh, so why don't you start off uh, and just kind of break down some of the story of Scythe or what it is that, that um, the board game represents. Yeah, it actually, it's, it's set in like an extended World War I period. Um, alternate steampunk Europe, and um, so it's like 1920, and there's all these, all the the belligerent uh, nations that were involved in this fictional World War One scenario have all come to this this one area, this nondescript European land, um, city state that surrounds this massive factory, and. The idea is is that the, the story is is that, if, that the factory has recently shut down. The factory is where all of the mechs, the steampunk mechs and stuff, or diesel punk. It's diesel punk, isn't it? Diesel punk I, mechs. I think of it as diesel punk, yeah. It's diesel punk. Although the, the distinctions there are so, you know. It's, it's, like, a, very, it's, it's like a very to name nerdy different distinction. Types of, it's like trying to name different types of metal. Yeah. You know, like, are you, oh, are you math metal or are you prog metal or are you, you know, apocalyptic metal? In a monolithic metal. Um, anyway, so the factory is shut down, and all these they, uh, these countries they send their their greatest military geniuses and their armies out to to secure this this land so that they can um, maybe restart the factory and only have that and like only have one nation have access to it. That's the story. Okay, so that's that's uh, quite a bit more story than I think we're used to getting in these games yes. that we've reviewed thus far. Yeah. Um, I guess, uh, unless Greg, do you have anything to add, uh, to Eric's synopsis? Yeah. I mean, I agree. The, the art is amazing. Um, I remember when the uh, Scythe was first introduced, actually, I remember when it was announced and they showed the cover of the box and that style of artwork, uh, I've always loved that, uh, it's not hyper-realistic 
it, it's it's just it's uh if you look if you go on to look any of this the the pictures on uh, about scythe or any of Jakub Brzezowski's pictures you, you'll, you'll know what i mean but it's i love that and i love that theme i'm a big steam slash diesel punk kind of fan i know that's cliche nowadays for nerds but i do like that theme so i so as soon as i saw that i was like oh man i want to check out this artist so i went on to Rizalski's website i looked through his stuff and, I, and it's, it's great but for me that does not necessarily mean that the game itself is going to feel like 1920s eastern european diesel punk <laughs> it mm. doesn't and i feel like this could be based anywhere uh, and I always kind of have this, this might just be me and me and Eric are different on this. There's always a disconnect with art and the game for me. For me, theme is going to come through mechanisms and art doesn't really help that. If, if the mechanisms don't support it, the art's there. And I always, I always say it's like, if, if you tell me this game comes with an amazing burrito, I can appreciate an amazing burrito and I enjoy amazing burritos, but that doesn't necessarily make the game itself better mm -hmm. so this is just me and i'm weird this way so i appreciate the, the the art i don't feel the theme coming through other than the fact that it's uh you know you're you're you there's some sort of like empire on the board expanding and getting resources is that 1920s eastern european diesel punk no <laughs> it's just you don't, that you don't it find... is it is though because it's it says it is and the art <laughs> Depicts it. I'm just you. Do, don't you have like uh, any imagination? Do, oh, I, let, me, I, let me genuinely. No, ask my you, imagination your, doesn't require art to fire up. No, but like when you're I have my own imagination. Turn, yes, I know, but you, but you just said that your your theme for you is is fueled by mechanics. Yeah, by mechanisms, and I, my my for me theme and mechanics are almost diametrically opposed. Like mechanics is I, how I you agree. do something. Theme is how you is how is the the thing that you feel that you're doing or you, that you can imagine that you're doing when yeah. you're doing the mechanics. And so like I, when, when I, when I'm playing Scythe, like I'm pretending in my head, you know, it's, it's kind of like none of it is, none of it comes out in the actual play, but in my, in my head, there's like a little story going on, you know, like there's, yeah, I, I, I have some that. character. For, yeah. So that's, I, I don't do that. And I think, I think it's because, um, this is going to come up a lot in our video reviews. So maybe I should just clarify it right now. Yeah, I don't. I don't play board games for that reason, right? I, I play board games out of a, a need for cognition. That's kind of my main reason to play. I like figuring out the the puzzles it gives me. If I want to get into theme or something, I'll play an RPG, <laughs> right? The st so for me, when I'm playing a turn of size, I'm not thinking about. Oh man, my steam is like crushing across this wheat field, and there's like peasants looking up in awe. Like I don't think of that, right? I just go if I go here, I get more wheat, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. And there, and for me to feel a theme in a game, it has to really be strong in the mechanism. I'm not saying I don't ever feel theme in games, but the mechanisms have to push that through. You can't. To me, side is like here's these things you're doing. Oh, and by the way, here's some reference art to tell you what you should be thinking about while you're doing this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's what the art's there for. It, right. It, it's it's, it's well, kind of like just like, hey, by the way, if you need something to tell you what you're doing right now, here's an art. <laughs> and I, you know, it doesn't translate yeah. for me in size. It doesn't come across that way. Sure. Well, l let me uh, let me play devil's advocate advocate for a second um, because I know Greg that you're. It seems like um, when it comes to this type of stuff, that you're a lot more keyed into or sensitive to music do you mm. think that if that if scythe came with like an epic soundtrack <laughs> that you had a certain track that like when you were coming into a big battle that involved you know there's some mechanical rule about it where like you were involved in a battle that involved you know more than a certain number of troops you put on this really amazing epic war soundtrack do you think that that would have any effect on oh. your Im on your headspace, as you not play. in scythe, not in scythe. I'm not. I'm not approaching. If if a game's gonna be really thematic, mm -hmm. I can get into it if I know going into it that's what this game is about. Mm -hmm. This game is about the drama. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, scythe is a hero game. Mm -hmm. That's it. And for me, when I go into scythe, I'm thinking, okay, this is all about the puzzle on the board. That's what we're figuring out. Mm -hmm. 
You know what I mean? That's what the game is about. Just because it's got fancy artwork doesn't change that to me. Mm-hmm. To me, I know for some people it does, but for me it doesn't. There's always a disconnect. I- I'll give you an example, like those um, and this is at, like the the we call those the cards that you pick up, the exploration cards. What are they called? Oh Eric? yeah, the um, yeah those are um, something like that. You know what I'm talking uh, about? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Ex- there's like these cards that you pick up that you're you're exploring or going on an adventure or something like that, supposedly. And you flip up the card, and there's this is an amazing piece of artwork, right? And then it's like three options of what you're doing, and it's like punch the civilian in the head and steal their apples, gain food, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Or or it's like always three choices: one's good, one's neutral, one's bad. I don't know. When I look at that, I, I know you're supposed to look at that artwork and imagine a scene where you're coming across these peasants. But at the end of the day, I'm just like, well, what do I need right now? Do I need food? Do I need popularity? I choose based upon that. Having come up with a story about it, it doesn't change anything because it's so disconnected from the rest of the game. It's not like I'm imagining my, oh yeah, I'm playing a very altruistic guy here. No, if I'm going to pick, if it's advantageous for me, I'm going to pick the bad option. Mm. You know what I mean? Because it's advantageous because I see it mechanically speaking. It, 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 it doesn't connect. Because if I pick up an expedition card one time, I choose the immoral option. And then the next time I choose the good option, I mean, it's not like my character is filling a character arc. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. To me, that's what I'm saying. It's all very disconnected for me. But I mean, um, it's I, I can see it being disconnected in terms of theme informing your choices beforehand, right? Like you wouldn't, you you mm-hmm. attic choice of like, well, I'm not a bad guy, so I'm not going to. Sure. Make... But... Post facto, you might work it in. Yeah, actually, at the, I, at the same time, exactly. I, I I could see theme coloring your experience after mm-hmm. the fact. Though. Yeah, and actually, I have a kind of a little theory and, around this. I, I I talk I talk about there's a such thing as uh, active narrative and inact and uh, passive narrative. Mm-hmm. And an active narrative is when you're actively trying to create a story, where you are making decisions based upon how you want the story to go. That's a pen and paper RPG, right? Right. Very, very few board games expect that of you. Mm-hmm. Passive narrative. Passive narrative is like if you are playing the game normally, trying to win through the mechanisms naturally, and from that, a story kind of naturally comes out of it. Mm-hmm. I actually get that sometimes in, say, Robinson Crusoe. Mm-hmm. Like, I can just sit there and try to play Robinson Crusoe, and at the end of the game, I can look back and go, oh, yeah, we met that gorilla, and... Uh, <laughs> Right, it was right. wearing clothes, you know, or whatever. It's like you know, I, I can have like a story come out of it. Yeah, scythe. I do not get a story. It doesn't naturally come in my head. I don't imagine my guy trouncing across wheat fields, coming across peasants and stealing mechs and stuff. I don't get any of that from the game. For me, it's one hundred percent mechanical. Yeah. But that's not bad. One hundred percent is not a bad thing for me. I think for me, like the theme can be um, momentary, or it can, or the, the it, it, theme has different scopes. So, uh, like, you can have a, a very thematic game, like Near and Far, say, where there's there's a story that's being told, although I don't think that implements it very well. A better example might be Star Wars Rebellion, where you're taking your actions in Star Wars Rebellion, and then at the end, you feel you played out a story. Like, oh, remember when Leia went to uh, Alderaan and, you know, all this stuff, and then they were about to blow it up, and you, know, you, you can feel all this stuff out, and, and that's a... That, is thematic on a whole game scale, whereas with Scythe, um, the the theme comes just in little snippets of imagination that is aided by the the art and components of the game. But I agree that it's there's not going to be an overarching um, there's not going to be much impetus to play thematically, if any, in Scythe. Yeah, and I agree. Rebellion has a lot of that's another example of a game that I feel is very thematic. And I yeah. feel like I was in a Star Wars universe. I guess at the end of the day, my final word in this um, is, I just feel a scythe, if you just change that artwork out to something like sci-fi, space, and we're going across planets and doing the same thing, to me, it would play exactly the same. It wouldn't feel any different to me. Because art does not affect me in that way. Theme has to be implemented through the mechanisms in a board game for me. Mm-hmm. So Because I, I'm very detached from art. When I pick up those expedition cards, I never look at the art. <laughs> okay. I would look at after the game, like, oh man, this art is amazing. Because, like, I think it's actually suggested in the rules that you pass those cards around. I know. It, that's they're ridiculous. just so beautiful. Who, who no, does that? I do you, it. You, 
You look to the I stack. I that in my game. But, but I'm this is exactly this is my burrito <laughs> thing though. This is the burrito thing. You can look at that stack of art before or after the game just fine and then appreciate sure. it. I just don't feel like I'm adding appreciation to the art in the middle of the game. I just feel like it's like it's like here's a card. And by the way, eat this burrito. Okay, here's your decision. <laughs> I, I how, buy a game that's that has how, free burritos with it. I would too, but it doesn't. <laughs> Get, all right, you hear that game publishers get on ground. that get on that publishers yeah. i want so, free burritos in my game all right well so let's uh so uh however it feels to play scythe uh then for greg it, it feels that way whether there's art included or not so well greg why don't you start off talk about for you how does it feel then to play scythe as you said it was a euro game yeah it's definitely a euro game i don't think that's in dispute honestly uh i think it the art and the, the plastic mechs and stuff, I think, can lead people to believe it's not a Euro, but I think at the end of the day, this is the Euro game. Um, but for, and at the, I think this is the feel of play to me. I think this is an efficient Euro. It's kind of how I imagine it. Yep. Uh, you, you kind of, I think the strategy, there are strategy, there are strategy in the game, but I think it's fairly straightforward. Um, they're not, all the strategies are not equal, of course, but... It's more like once you get your strategy, who can implement that strategy the most efficiently? That's the person that's going to win the game. Um, who who can figure out doing multiple things in a single turn? And to me, that's what the whole game is about. Is like how can I do what I want to do in the least amount of turns? Because I also think, in, a, in addition to being an efficiency euro, uh, it's also that gives into the fact that it's also a race or a game to me. I feel everyone's racing to get their... Like you're supposed to put six stars. That's how you finish the game. Everyone's kind of racing to get these six stars down on the board. Um, it's also a game of multiple... What I think of as multiple small engines. Uh, it's a constant... Where you're, there's all these different little engines you can get going. And those engines are constantly giving you bonuses and rewards. Uh, it, it's one of those kind of games I feel that it's like every time you do a move, it's like, boom, here's a new special power boom, take some free wheat. You know, it's always like opening up stuff and giving it to you. And there's multiple tracks that you can do that on. Um, so there's that too. It's also the, the turns I feel are kind of like micro turns in a way. Uh, like a lot of games that I play, it'll say on your turn, step one, move your people. Step two, produce. Step three, build or something like that. In this game, they kind of like take that and they break it uh, to different turns. So on one turn, I'll move. Next turn, I produce. So there's micro turns too, which uh, kind of changes the feel of the game. And I do want to reiterate, just for people who maybe have not played this game and is thinking about it, don't be fooled by the box cover and the plastic mechs. This is not a combat-heavy game, despite that. And and the rule book itself says that combat is more of a is more of the uh, uh, reluctance to combat than it is combat itself. So I, yeah, it's not combat heavy. So that's kind of how feel of play to me is what it is. Okay. All right. Uh, Eric, what about for you? How does it feel to play? So the initial piece of artwork that spawned this game was a big old mech in the background and a person farming in the foreground. And the play, the, the entendre there, uh, not entendre, the dub, the, 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 the double the word entendre. use, the double, on, yeah, the word, uh, the word use of scythe being possibly a, a weapon of war and also a, a weapon of agriculture is the, the blending of this game. Um, so, so yes, it's not a war game, though it might feel that way. Uh, this is, this is a, it's got a lot of different things going on in it. But a, basically the way it plays is a player, uh, each player gets a player board and a character board randomly. So the, there's some um, opportunities for replayability there. And then the uh, players take turns moving a selection meeple onto one of four action spaces and then doing as many things as possible that are allowed on that space. So each action space allows for two actions. And there's a top row action and a bottom row action. And if you can afford both, then you can do both. And in general, top row actions are more basic and they include things like movement and resource production whereas bottom row actions are more advanced and include things like mech deployment or player board upgrades and stuff like that. 
uh, when a player has done all of one type of thing, kind of like uh, deploying all mechs or getting all getting max military strength and so on, then they place a star. Greg mentioned stars. They place a star on the board uh, indicating that. And that's kind of like getting an achievement or a trophy in a video game. If you can, if you know how in a video game, if you can do all of something, um, then you, you know, a trophy pops up or an achievement pops up. Same thing in this game. So you get a star for doing all of something. And when you play six stars, then the game ends and whoever has the most money wins. Okay. Um, to that end, I would say that Greg's right. This is a racing game. And if you, but you, there are multiple strategies that you can try to implement in order to get your stars out. Uh, but notice that there's a disconnect there between placing stars ends the game, whereas whoever has the most money wins. So if you are the player who plays your sixth star, stars are valuable. They're worth money. But if you place your sixth star and you don't have enough money to win the game, then you've just intentionally lost. So you, um, one strategy, if you're not, if you're, if you don't have a fast engine going, is you can try to make more money than the person who is pumping out their stars and make it so they don't want to end the game. So there's, it's a race, but you can also kind of like, uh, you can make it so the person who's ahead in the race doesn't want to finish the race because they'll lose, which is an interesting yeah. dynamic. It, it should be noted that you, the money that Eric's talking about comes from different means, too. That's basically like uh, every star you get turns into money, and like every hex that you occupy turns into money, and uh, I think resources turn into a little bit of money. And then that's also, what's kind of neat in this game, too, is that popularity track, where depending on where your popularity is in the game, depends on how much money you exchange that in for. So your stars might be worth more at the end of the game if you're more popular than the, some other person, uh, which is kind of neat. So there's, there's, there's like different factors that come into how much money slash victory points you're going to get at the end of the game. Okay. Uh, Eric, let me ask you this, because um, since we're kind of starting to get into you know some strategic considerations and things like that, but before we go too far down that, uh, let me ask you, since this is the game that you have personally spent the most money on, um, is there something, was there something specific when you played this game um, in terms of its feel that m made you want to go all in for it, or was it just the fact that it happened to be a game that offered beautiful art, beautiful components, things like that? Yeah, so it's it's primarily that it was, it had such beautiful art but also i i find this extremely playable i have i've played this more than probably any other game that i own mm -hmm. more more times and so i i really in spoilers but i really enjoy this game and i want to get it on the table uh frequently <laughs> no, I, I was just going to say how disappointing it would be if this is one of the games that you spend a ton of money on and you end up hating the game i hated it yeah. Yeah. no i actually, knew i knew actually, i knew ahead of time i hate this game but i still spent all <laughs> money on it. Yeah, I knew, yeah, so that, that's that's a good way to answer your question, Micah, because I knew ahead of time that this was a game that I really enjoyed and so, therefore, I wanted to, and since it had the opportunity to um, to really make it more beautiful, I got all the upgrades, and there's a ton of little things you can get for this game, not just beautifying it, but also expansion-wise, the little mini-expansions, like I got the encounters, that's what they are, Greg, they're called encounters. Encounters, that's right. That's yeah, right. so encounter, you, something. you can get uh, a big pack of uh, encounter cards, so new ones that uh, are super random, and, you know, I got the, I got the, um... Yeah, what all did you get? What's what's the cool bling stuff you got? Well, a lot of it is in the art that I that I sent you, so um, the the most expensive stuff were the, the metal mechs, there's zinc, they're, they're zinc mechs. So um, those were like very, um, they didn't make many of them. Um, so I, I got in on that. And you could get one of, just one set of of each. So you could get like, because every, every character has four mechs. Um, but if you got one set of the mechs, it only had one metal mech of, for each player. So you had to get four sets in order to get the whole thing. So I got four sets. Uh, wow. So that's that's how much I I, I enjoy this. But um, all these, if you go to what's that uh, company, Greg? Is it Meeple Source? Meeple Which one? Source, right? The Meeple one that Source? does all the upgraded um, components. They kind oh, of yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. Meeple Source components. is one of them. Yeah. So you go to Meeple Source, type in scythe, and you can see all the the cool stuff that they've basically upgraded pieces and components. It's great. 
Okay, cool. All right, well, uh, then why don't, um, to talk about uh, strategy, why don't we then go to you, Eric, as our resident Scythophile. Scythe, yes, Scythophile. <laughs> Uh, and you can uh, give us, uh, after after your extensive plays with it, uh, what are some strategies that you have extracted from Scythe? So you've got to think about fa uh, three phases of Scythe. There's uh, opening, middle, and end game. And you have different goals in each of those phases. So in the opening, you need to mostly be concerned with checking off some basics. Otherwise, you'll be um, you'll be super gimped throughout the rest of the game. So you want to to make sure that you have at least one mech, usually your speed mech. Don't get super distracted by the riverwalk mechs because um, there's there's usually more efficient ways to get it across water um, than your riverwalk. Um, focus on your speed mech first, usually. Uh, if you're Rusviet, yet, then you want to get your, your river walk first. But that's deeper strategy than we're going to go into today. Get at least one speed mech, or get at least one mech. Get probably about five workers on the map. Get one or two enlists out. Start with your money enlist. You're, you're the one that gives you, you money. And then maybe get an upgrade if you're an upgrade or two if your board combo isn't very efficient. So those are your, your opening, that's your opening checklist to get those things. The, the upgrades, don't get them if you don't need to. If your board and character combos are good, then don't worry about upgrades. Just focus on the, on the other things that I mentioned. Then as you switch, uh, shift in the middle game, you need to get a plan. You need to plan out how you're going to put your stars on the board. Remember, this is a race game. So you want to get star, you want to get your stars out as fast as possible. Um, and some stars are better than others because the action that that star is tied to is just naturally more useful in the game. So high priority stars are enlists, workers, mechs, and power. Low priority stars are popularity and upgrades. Upgrades seem really tempting, but, um, but because there's, you have to do eight of them to get the star as opposed to just four for like mechs, it's just not, um, is it eight or six? It might be six. I'd have to look at it again. Uh, it's it's just a much slower star to get, so don't don't get trapped by that. Um, so combat and objective stars they can be either high priority or low priority depending on your player or uh, character board combo. So that's your that's your middle game, and then finally in the end game you want to spread out into as many spaces as possible. This is rough. This is roughly the time you're going to want to get your your. Uh, um, your worker star because you want to go up to all eight workers, uh, and that's that's a star. So you and then spread those guys out as far as possible. Finish off with your last star, and you will win. Scythe. congratulations! Cool. You're welcome. Internet. All right, easy enough, Greg. What do you think? Well, I I don't have anywhere near the amount of plays Eric has, but I have some rough strategies in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, having I've, I've I've won this game a few times and I've lost this game horribly a few times. So I can I can base upon what caused me my loss. I can think about that and how when I won what I was doing differently. So this is very beginner level strategies here. But I think I, I mentioned earlier in the field of play that it feels like there's like a dozen engines in this game that you can get rolling. And that's kind of how I see it. And you kind of start them up and then eventually they get faster and faster and they give you more and more things. But I think you don't want to get them all going. I think in the beginning, you kind of need to figure out where am I going to get my six stars and stay focused on that. I think it's really easy to get distracted on this. So even though there's all these, there's a dozen engines you could get going, you only want to get five or six of them going. <laughs> is this a, <laughs> is this a find your lane thing? No, it's not actually. I'll, I'll talk about find your lane a little later, but no, it's not. It's not a find your lane thing. It's just what, how am I going to win this game? What's my strategy for this game? And that can be based upon, because find your lane implies that like, I'm not going to do this because other players are doing it. I don't right. think your strategy is too affected by what other players are doing. I think you can pick, these are the, my stars. This is where they're going to come from, regardless of what the other players are really doing. You just need to kind of pick and choose and then just, just focus on that, mm -hmm. in my opinion. 
I, I think uh, the games that I've lost, I got kind of distracted. Like, oh man, this would be really efficient for me to start doing this other thing over here. But I never get it going enough to actually get a star out of it. You know, it, it's because, and that just distracts me from where I could have put my time and energy into other stars, I guess, if that makes sense. So I, I, I think don't get distracted by all the things you can do in this game, because a lot you can do on, on your turn. Just kind of focus. That's kind of the only thing I can really think of. Uh, I do think don't overlook the popularity track, but don't get too concerned about it. But do know the end game comes fast. <laughs> the game starts slow, and it feels like, oh man, this is going to take forever to get six stars. And then one turn, someone puts down three stars. <laughs> you know, So you have to be conscious of what other people are doing in that regard. It is a race game, um, but you kind of have to find where everyone else is in the race. Because if you think someone's going to end the game, as Eric kind of talked about earlier, you're going to have to kind of slow them down if you're not going to win. So because that end game can come quick. So you got to be, you got to pay attention to that. Um, as far as the other stuff, uh, expeditions encounters. I, I, or encounters, yeah. Uh, I think you should grab uh, the easy ones first, you know, just, just kind of get them if they're close to you. Uh, and the factory has some pretty powerful cards in there. But I do think that if you're going to go factory, you don't have to. But if you're going to go factory, I would say get it early so that you can use it. Um, but, I, you know, See, the thing wanna, about wanna... Scythe is I don't think any one of these strategies is like, oh, if you do this, you're going to win. You do this, you're going to win. No. I, I don't think, I'm, like, I think you can completely ignore factory. I think you can completely ignore counters and still win the game. I'm just saying, if you're going to do it, do it early, I think. Because yeah. The, yeah, just yeah. a little bit of caveat on that. That's one of the most um, easy traps to fall into is focusing on encounters. This is what got you the last game, Greg. You focus so much on encounters. Um, yeah, I sucked up like six encounters. <laughs> you got so many encounters, which because the encounters are so cool. When you get them, it's like just free stuff. But yeah. focusing on them, it, it ends up being not efficient because you, you're just getting free stuff and you're not you're not producing, you're not changing anything on your board that allows you to get more stuff automatically. Yeah, so, I, and, I and the factory cards are a trap too. Some, if you can get them, Greg's right, get them early. Um, but, but I would say eighty percent of the time, I don't even think about getting a factory card. Mm -hmm. Which is, yeah, but which, I'm just honestly, saying, if you do, does, if you do, and it's easy, yeah, I totally, do think that totally. they're pretty powerful. They so I, I agree that I lost miserably my last game, but I, I do agree that I should not have ran. I, it was just me trying something new, but I ran around yeah. all these encounter cards. But uh, I got a factory card early, and I had a pretty powerful engine going there. I got my four mechs out in like four mm -hmm. turns because it was the nice thing yeah. about those factory cards is they don't trigger other people's enlists. Exactly, which yeah. is so irritating because I got my like I got I get this enlist with the enlist ability is something that that benefits you and your neighbor benefits you if you or your neighbors do something do a particular thing right so i got the one for for mech deployment uh and greg was sitting right next to me so every time he got his mech out i'd be like did, did you deploy and he's like no i used my factory card which doesn't trigger it so i didn't get it any of the benefits both, from it both players on both sides, both sides. Did, you, did you deploy a mech like nope use my factory card i never <laughs> even touched that deploy spot because yeah. i didn't need to because i had that factory card that was awesome but <laughs> But they that are, was another they, reason why I wanted encounters, awesome. because the factory card gives you double movement. So mm -hmm. basically, it was easy for me to build a mech and then move my guy to pick up an encounter. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just like, well, might as well. I'm building a mech, might as well move this guy and pick up an encounter. Um, it wasn't the best strategy. And I know And later on, I, like I said, I got distracted by other things I shouldn't have been doing. That's why I lost. But um, yeah, that, those are my entry-level tips, I guess. Uh, you mentioned... Um about the playtime, about uh, the in speeding up on you. What is the player count and running time for this game? This this game is um, this game has issues there. So it's it. I think it plays really well at. I think it plays really well at three to three to five, and then it can go up to seven if you have the expansion. It, well, we're t we're just talking about the base game. So base game goes up to five. Um, so I would just say like later on when we talk about the expansion that lets you play up to seven, it bogs down there, but you, but up to but the four to five, that's, that's the best. And it plays about, I would say 45 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes per player. If the players really know what they're doing, 
Greg mentioned that the turns, like you just, you do one thing on your turn. Like, unlike other games where you, like he said, where it's like, oh, you know, you take a turn and there's phases of your turn. There are no phases of your turn in this. It's like, just you put your, your action meeple down and choose those. Okay, so you move. Move two guys. Done. Move on. So it can go really fast. All right, well, then let's get into the good and the bad of Scythe. Uh, and Eric, why don't you start out by telling us what you feel Scythe did well? I, I, I really like this game. It's not perfect, but I, I really enjoy playing it. And it's, it's just, there's a lot to it, is, is the thing. It's, it's easy to teach, but at the same time, there's so much depth of strategy that I feel like you could you could spend a long time. I know that there's there's official tournaments of this game, and people get pretty serious about this game, and that speaks to its complexity. So it's kind of like an onion. I've never really had a bad experience showing this game. I, I once taught this game to a bunch of people who had never played board games of this caliber before. And they all understood it, and they all had a good time. You know, they were playing <laughs> poorly in a sense, but they all had a good time. And I think that's that's a really exceptionally rare feature of board games, where you can bring a bunch of new people into it and have you know you set you set up side that looks really intimidating. When they walked, I had said about when they walked in, they're like, "What are we doing tonight?" They were freaked out. But when I taught them the rules and they played it, and this is a five-player game, and it played really well, and everybody had a fun time. Um, it all, but if you want to get really into it, there's so much strategy here, so much different things. The the way that the gears of this game interlock, it's surprising. It's surprising how much depth there is to this. It, it's it, it's kind of a, a well-oiled game. In, in this, in that kind of euro gamey kind of sense, you feel like the pieces click together well. They do, yeah. It's not as not as efficient as like a true euro. I I, I wouldn't call this a a true euro game. Not like um, like Puerto Rico. You know, this is more. It, it, they, don't, they don't click that well. <laughs> but um, all the different ways you can get stars and um, the. The, the random setup, and you have to spend quite a bit of time looking at, like, okay, which player board did I get? Which character board did I get? How do those work together? What new strategy will emerge from this combination and my position on the map? There's just so many things to think about. It's very engaging. Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, Greg, what about you? What did you like about Scythe? Yeah. Um, I agree with Eric. It's a good intro game for a lot of people. And, and I, for some reason, in my mind, I always think of, like, a stereotypical situation that a group of people will get into gaming. They'll they'll pick up Catan and they'll play that for a while. Like, oh, what other board games are there? I always feel like Scythe is like a, the next step. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I see that a lot. In fact, I think Stonemeyer Games in general, the publisher of this game, is good for that. Like, I see them as like, hey, okay, you, you got your feet wet. Well, here's a whole company that does games that you're going to like well. So I'm just going to say that I notice that with people. For whatever reason... This game speaks to people as uh, it's got a very devoted following. This game does. It's um, the artwork. I think it's the artwork, but I, but I think yeah, it's also the right weight. I mean, it's just the right amount of crunchiness. There's something about this game that really appeals to people. So I I, I, I absolutely give it props for that. And I 100% agree with Eric that it's a smooth game. This is an incredibly well oiled machine. Um, it's I, I can tell that. Uh, Jamie did a lot of playtesting with this game. <laughs> I think his games in general, you can tell mostly uh, that that they're heavily playtested. Um, but it's uh, because yeah, I just everything feels oh, cool. everything. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it straight up, but <laughs> but yeah, everything everything uh, just clicks very well. Like there's no real rough edges in this game. Um, it's a very well oiled machine, so I'll, I'll, I'll give it that. Um, and with the turns. Uh, if people know the game, if people are familiar with the game, the turns go lightning fast in this game. And in fact, the book, the instruction manual suggests that when you're doing your bottom action, the other player can start taking their turn because the bottom actions don't usually affect other people. So you, get, you can get to a situation that if everyone knows the game well, 
you can be taking your bottom section and then like, oh, it's my turn already. <laughs> you know, it, it, so there, it, if you have a lot of experienced players, there's very little downtime unless you get into like some crazy. That's something that I count. think is, that the people have said in pretty much every game that I've played of this. Like, so it's like, whoa, it's, it's already my turn. Wow. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. The, the turns are really fast here. Um, I do also want to give props out to the production. I know we talked a lot about the art. Um, in particular, I, it's a small thing. But I really love the double layered boards. <laughs> it's, mm. If I could carry one thing over to other games, I mean, everything else like the the the, the mechs are cool. I mean, I, I'm not usually enthused about mechs and stuff like that. But in this game, they actually make sense because there's a difference between plastic pieces and what they can do in wooden pieces. So there's actually like a mechanical difference that I appreciate. Yeah, but yeah the double layered boards. I know they're expensive to make, but man, it's so nice having a little place. Yeah, that's actually a, a, a quick way to. A quick way to teach the the game. Uh, one little quick thing is just to say only plastic can fight. You know, it's yeah. it, that's so it's it's such a neat little thing that they like wooden pieces can't fight. Yeah, so yeah. It's super easy. So yeah, the production is great in this game. I I, I mean I, I'm gonna get some flack for this. I, I do think the map is a little muddled, uh, but <laughs> it's a little the it's a little too saturated for my taste. But uh, otherwise, I I do think the the production's great in this game, and I, I thought you said before that this was an overproduced game. You considered this overproduced? No. Well, let's be clear here. I feel like, yeah, it is in a way. I'm because in general, I'm very content with my games just being. I'm, I'm your boring cube pusher fan, you know. So I, I'm usually very content with games just having cubes and stuff like that, and as long as it's easy to read. But I can't deny the fact that if you put this out in front of somebody, it's going to their eyes are going to light up. I mean, I see it, right? And I'm not against it here. It never, I never feel like it's uh, like I said. The 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 mechs are different colors. They're different molds. Oh, no, they're not. There. Are they different colors? They are, right? Yeah, yeah they're, they're all different colors. colors they're different colors. molds. So I don't. My problem with with uh, minis in general is sometimes they it's hard to know what I'm looking at. They all look just big blobs of gray plastic after a while. But here, I don't, I don't feel that. And I do like tactility. You know, I always talk about that in games. And, you know, it's nice moving those big heavy mechs around. So, no, I'm not going to be like, this is so amazingly produced. It is. But in particular, those boards do deserve a shot up. Because that is an actual boost in how you play the game. Because you don't have to worry about your, your cube sliding off where you've got things marked. So And when, and when you say double air board, you mean the fact that, like, the board has... It has recesses. It has, like, has recesses inside it where you can see yeah. in and they don't they don't yeah. slide around it's, at the board job. Exactly. Which is nice. I mean I will give props for it to do. Um and finally there's a little mechanism in this game that I really wish other games would do. And that is when you produce a resource, it stays on the board. Such a good I love I love that about role. this game. So few games do that. Um others there's other games that do, do it, but I, I just wish more would do that. It just it's just it makes it, it just keeps them in the open. The, the the threat that they could be stolen from somebody else. It's just an extra nuance that just adds to the to the strategy. I think I just wish more games did it. So yeah, I like that. I do like that mechanism here. Okay, uh, well let's go into what you wish it did better, Greg. Um, why don't you start with that then? Where could it have been? All right, a little bit of preamble here because this game has a big following, <laughs> and the people love this game. Love this game. It's really high in the BGG rankings. So I just want to... It's got a fanboy base, all right? Anytime you go after a game that's got a fanboy base, people get their feelings hurt. Just because I have things to say about your game doesn't mean I have things to say about you as a person. You just, just text separate. me. Just those those, write, those text things in, come later. Te, write, write me in the comment, comments, anybody. I'll send you his address. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to make it really clear. I don't hate this game. I think it's a fine game. But I do feel it's a bit overhyped. I, I, I'm going to say that. Um, this game is huge. It's huge, and I cannot quite figure out why. Aside from the production, and that's the only thing I can figure. The production doesn't affect me like it does other people. Because So here's the thing. Even Jamie Stegmaier says that his main inspirations for this game were Terra Mystica and Kemet. Those are the two games that really inspired him. And I have not played Kemet, but from what I know of the game, I mean, I've, I've looked through the rules and stuff. It's a very aggressive, hyper-attacky game. It is. <laughs> you know? So if you're going into that this game thinking, oh, this is going to be a game about mechs and 
and fighting, Kemet just seems like a better game for that. But then the, the, the more telling one to me is Terra Mystica. And there's also a re-implementation of Terra Mystica Gaia project. It's based on the science fiction theming of it. And I, it's just such a better game than this, in my opinion. It, it's, I, I just don't know that there's anything Scythe is doing that, I, that those games don't do better. It, it, and, and I can see the inspiration because it's got asymmetrical powers. There's the whole, like, you're vying for territory. Um, there's multiple tracks that you're moving up and getting boosts on. But it's just such a meteor game. And uh, it, there's, there's, in, there's impetus to, like, get into conflict with people. Conflict. Because you're not really. But I mean, to get in people's faces, I should say. Because there's, there's, there's discounts for building next to other people, for example. So there's, there's immediately going to be fights on the board uh, uh, in, in those games. So I'm, it's, it's, for me, it's just I, Scythe doesn't do anything new. It doesn't really. So do it sounds new. like it sounds like your main criticism of Scythe is that it isn't Gaia Project. Well, it's just if you're going to, if for me to like a game, or or for me to say, hey, this does, belongs in my collection, then yeah, it has to do something that other games are not doing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? If there's another right. game that does something very similar but better, then why play the inferior version? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, no, for sure. I mean, it, but it's sort of a separate question, like, what could this game have done better versus is this game going in my collection or two different questions. Yeah, and, uh, and, yeah so, I mean, what it probably does better, it's, it's lighter, it's easier to teach than, mm -hmm. than Gaia Project, for sure. Um, it's less mean, for sure. Um, it's the production's better. So if those things are interesting to you, this might be better. And, and I want to be clear here. I don't think a game has to be new and innovative to be a good game. Mm -hmm. yep. So I'm just putting that out there. I just think that the game... But theoretically, theoretically game, a game that is later should, you know, should have thought about previous games and advanced somewhat. There should be some progress yeah. in gaming. Is what you're, and I'm is not what even saying. saying that size is not a progress. I think it is to some people. Just for my gaming taste, it's not. Um, yeah, I guess. Well, I guess no. I, what I was saying is that you're 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 saying that Gaia Project and Terra Mystica that those are did those come before Scythe? Yes. Well, Terra oh, Mystica did. Terra Mystica okay. did for sure. Um, so you yeah. think they're therefore that barely, like I think 2017 or something. Yeah, Gaia Project is a reimplement. It's almost exactly yeah, yeah, same yeah. game as Terra, Terra Mystica. It's so just, you're saying that that like that Scythe actually gets gets docked because it doesn't do you know Terra Mystica did something better, and it actually is doing the same game, but worse. Yeah, basically, for me. For me and my tastes, it's just, I don't, I mean, because I'm trying to think, like, and just, just this is just putting in the context of size hype. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it's in so many number one lists, and I'm trying to think, what is it doing that's so much better than other games? And I just don't know. I don't, I don't see it. Yeah. Well, so, I guess I'm, the reason I'm asking is I'm trying to kind of push a little bit to say, okay, like, if, if the problem is that it's not as good as Gaia Project, rather than just leaving it at that, it's, you know, what is it about it that Gaia Project did better that it's not doing well? And, you know, like, I'm trying to get... Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. Just, okay, this, okay, sorry. <laughs> this is just the beginning. Okay, right, your preamble. <laughs> yeah, there's this preamble. Let me, let me get into some more details as to what okay. I think Scythe is not doing good for me. Sure. Okay, I, just, I gotta reiterate, this is my opinion. So, for me... One of the main gripes I have with Scythe is, and I'm always going to bring this up, is interaction. There's not a lot of places where you're like interacting with the other players. I feel like you're kind of got your little silo in the corner of the board, and you occasionally go out and do some combat here and there. You occasionally fight over certain hexes, but a lot of what you're doing is kind of in your little silo. Um, the interaction is supposed to come from the map, and like you, you expanding on the map and interacting with other players, but the map never feels cramped to me. There's never, like in a lot of games where it has like these hexes with resources and it forces you to go out and fight other players, it's because there's just not enough resources in your home territory to sustain you. So the game forces you to leave your home area and fight with other players to, 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 to contest other hexes because you just won't survive without that resource. But Scythe, I don't think is necessary. I, don't, I never feel cramped because you only have a max amount of workers and you can put them on the same hex and produce double the resource or three of the times the resource. So I feel like you can maintain your empire back in your home territory. You know, you don't, you, there's no, there's no impetus to 
expand out so much, aside from that extra hexes give you extra points. Um, that, that could be a reason. At the so, end of the game. At the end of the game, yeah. And the main question is, is it worth the points? And the answer to that could be no. I don't think you need to expand out the win. It could be. You could decide that, that I want to expand out, but you don't have to. And that's the point I wanted too. Is I, it's, I'm not saying every game of Scythe is non-interactive. I think they can be. And I'm sure someone's going to say, hey, I had a game where you fought a bunch. I'm not saying it, it, they're all that way. But I'm just saying the game doesn't push it forward. Um, it, it's not, it, it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to fight. Um, and it's not even a find your lane game. That's what I talked about earlier, where you're trying to find the one thing that other people are not doing. And I don't even think that's like necessarily a high form of interaction. Mm-hmm. Where like, oh, I'm going to produce wheat because you're not. But that doesn't exist in this game. I just choose the strategies I want to go with, and I just go with it, and there's not much people can do about it. And then combat. Let me talk about combat for a little bit here. Combat just kind of falls flat for me in this game. I don't like the system. <laughs> the whole, I bid a certain amount and I flip over this. These, we compare these two numbers because I, for one, defeat is not a big deal. This this is like child's combat. Um, I I just warp back to my home territory with all of my stuff intact. That's the, the that's the penalty for losing combat. That doesn't feel like combat to me. And then a lot of times, even I want to get defeated in combat. Because maybe I want to get back to my home territory. Yeah, it happens all the time. Eric, don't give me that face. <laughs> you're giving Sometimes, somebody a star free, when you do that. Free, uh, yeah, but I mean, if that star. person... I'm just saying, if, but if they're not a threat, I don't really care. I mean, if I think that... If I think it's worth it for me, like maybe I'm way out of field. I'm like, you know what? I wish someone would attack me now because I really want to zoom back to my home territory. There's stuff I need to do back there. I'm just saying, it's not always even a penalty so much. It never really hurts too much to lose combat. And I've seen it constantly. A person goes, yeah, I don't care about this combat. I, uh, I'll bid one point. I'll get my combat card, and I'll, I'll zip back to my home base. I don't know. It just never feels like a big deal. To me. And at the end of the day, even, if you really don't want people to attack you, I don't think it's hard to prevent it. If you got workers on you, if you got the right amount of... I mean, it's, it's, to me, this game is not difficult to prevent combat from happening to you. I think you can dissuade people from doing that pretty easily. And then it just feels opportunistic, too. The combat is just like, well, I need my star, so I'm going to attack you. Like, I never feel people attack people because, like, oh, man, I really want that hex you have with all that wheat. So the idea of the resources being on the board is nice, but I don't know. It just never comes up to me. It doesn't That's the way it, it happened in our last game. You just happened to be there. I wanted the star, so I attacked you. Yeah. So, yeah, that is true. And I think that's common. I think and it, yeah. it, it's just I feel like the combat happens because you kind of have to. <laughs> you, need, you want the star, and it's easy to do, so it's opportunistic in that way. All right, this is the final one. I almost didn't want to bring this up because I'm not sure this is so much a game issue or a group issue, but every time I have had my biggest... Whenever I check out of Scythe, whenever I'm like, oh, man, I wish this game would end, this is the main reason I'm about to bring up, but I was hesitant to do it because it's not necessarily a game issue so much, but I think this game exasperates it, so I am going to talk about it. And that is people who have analysis paralysis, who have AP where people who are learning the game can really bog this game down. And let me tell you why. That's, that's true of any game. But let me tell you why I think this game is worse. It's an open information game, which is nice. There's very little player interaction. There's micro turns. So all of that combined means, and it's not a very super heavy game, so a lot of that combined means that sometimes I'll be sitting there thinking, okay, well, I want to do this, 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 and this. And I'll have my because it's micro turns, I realize that me getting over there and doing this thing is going to take four or five turns to do that. And then you got people who are not used to the game or they're not really taking, they're not really doing the turns and people are doing their bottom action. And now I got to wait for them to do their thing. And I'm waiting four or five turns to do the thing that I already know I want to do. I have this all planned out and it's going to take me four or five turns to do it. Now, if everyone's on top of things, those turns are fast. But if you got a few people that are not, those turns can feel like an eternity to me. And, and that really bogs the game down to me sometimes. Um, and what they're doing isn't that interesting. I don't really care what the other players are doing. They're not really doing things that are going to affect me. In other games, when there's... I actually am fine with analysis paralysis, and I encourage it. Because, like, hey, think out your turn. 
But in heavier games, I can often go, man, I'm glad they're thinking about that because I really want to look up my turn. I really want to figure this out. It gives me time to think about what I want to do. But in this game, that's not the case. So it's just like, oh, i got to wait five more minutes before I can just move my guy one space. <laughs> you know? And that just really bogs the game down for me. So if you're playing with people who are not used to scythe and have analysis paralysis and are not on top of taking their turns, I feel like this game can bog down. And for me, I just get awfully bored in this game when that happens. So th there's that. But that could just be Eric's group. That's true. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay, Eric, well, you heard all of Greg's problems. Uh, what about you, in spite of your deep and abiding love of Scythe? What, your darkest hours of the night, <laughs> do you wish that Scythe could do better? Well, um... And also, do you want to respond to any of that yeah, stuff? Yeah, I was thinking about responding to, to Greg. Um, but honestly, in a lot of ways, I agree with I agree with him. Um, honestly, at this point, Greg's Greg's responses were were not memorable enough for me to even recall what they were. So I can't uh, I can't rebut them. Uh, but <laughs> but I, I will say that I do agree. Um, th and this is why you never grow as a person. <laughs> it does bog down a little bit. Um, actually, quite a bit, and and it's not it's not because turns can be so long, but because turns can be so short. So it's on the other end. It's it's when somebody takes such a you know some some games bog down because when it's your turn, it's like the turns are like okay, well, I got to think through all this stuff. The reason this one bogs down is when you're playing with someone who doesn't know the game and they're like, oh, I don't okay, well, you know, rules questions and whatnot you're eventually waiting to do one simple thing. And so it's so yeah. like, I, I'm waiting all this time just to do one thing. It, it's interesting that there's like a, there's a, a balance thing there where it's, it's not analysis paralysis because the turns are so complex, but because they're so simple it, that it's a similar problem. I agree. I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, also there, there can be, um, it can be somewhat misleading as to what the game's about because you look at the game and you think Greg mentioned this already, but you think it, it's going to be like a risk style game or like Lords of Hellas or something. And it's not, it's a uh, mechs. Their primary reason, your primary reason you, you have a mech is so that you can move your, your workers around. That's the, the, the primary thing. And then uh, I would say the other downside to it is that the game is so, um, it's so, this is a, a common problem. This, we talked about this with Puerto Rico, that when a game gets really well tuned, when there's a lot of, when, well, when there's a lot of interacting parts, there's a lot of places that can go wrong later. Uh, Stegmeier did a ton of playtesting on this game, but there's a couple of balance issues in the game that he has then subsequently made uh, house, uh, not house rules. He's made official rules that you can't play with certain board player, board combos. Um, so there's, the, it, that's just like an additional thing that you need to, to think about. Where if a player, if a player gets Crimea and I, I don't know what it is, industrial or something like that, they can, if they know what they're doing, they can beat the game in 14 turns. And that's not, that's not fun. For anybody, so he banned that. So there's some, there's some there's some balance issues, but overall, uh, I would say that the game the game plays really well when everybody knows what they're doing. There's it's really hard for me to describe what to to try to rebut what Greg said because it's so difficult to articulate without if you don't know what how Scythe plays because if you know what you're doing, combat makes sense. You know, if you it is it is somewhat I would say it is somewhat arbitrary that like okay, I just want my star. But if everybody knows that, then then combat becomes even even more critical. Like you're like, okay, I know if you're paying attention to other players and you're like, I know they need that star, they don't have it yet. I can't just let my my guy sit there because he's a target for somebody getting their star. So if everybody's on the same board, is on the same page, combat becomes really exciting. And I don't dislike combat in this game. I think it's really interesting because there's a bluffing aspect. It's light, but there's a bluffing aspect to this game where you can you can go in and pretend like you've got a lot to a lot going on for you, but you don't actually. Um, you don't have the the combat cards to to really make it val make it um, valid that you're going to win the game or win the win the combat. So there's some bluffing there. You can also go in and have a lot 
but you don't want to spend it because you're so close to getting the the military power card or military power star. So I don't know. There's there's a lot there's a lot more to combat if everybody knows how combat works. Now, granted, if there's new players, they're going to leave themselves open to to combat, and that's going to throw off the game. So in some in some ways, I would say that a similar criticism to Puerto Rico, where this game is so finely balanced that if a if there's a bad player, it does change the dynamic of the of the entire game. So that would also be a a, a downside, in my opinion. Okay, very good. Well, uh, so pretty comprehensive commentary on Scythe. Uh, let's go ahead and begin to wrap it up with our final thoughts. Uh, I want to hear from you guys what your rating is, would you recommend it, and how do you feel about it going on our shelf? So why don't I start with you, Eric? I do recommend this. I think that there's something here for everyone, and I rate it an 8. Uh, my breakdown is I, I think it gets a really, really good rating on three of the, of the, of my five categories. So the what if category, like, well, what, you know, what if I had done this differently or that differently? That's the, it gets um, two stars on that one. Um, high five. This one actually changed for me. This used to be uh, only a one, but the more you figure, figure out the strategies of this game, the more things you figure out that you can do and tactics that you can implement, the more you feel um, excited at being able to do that. So the more you go into this game, the more the deeper you dive into this game, the more ex- the more high fivey this game gets. Where it's like, yes, I managed to pull off that strategy that I read, that I read about. So that gets a two stars there too. Hands down, this this the 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 picture. Do you want to take a picture of this game? Obviously, this game is gorgeous. It's really really pretty. Where it falls a little short is in the pop song category and the bathroom category. So those are the two categories about player interaction, where there's 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 not a whole ton of it. So pop song, do I really need? Can, can there be a pop song, a popular song, a catchy song playing in the background uh, while I'm taking my turn? Kind of, you know. I rate this a one on that. It still succeeds, but not awesomely because your your turns are so quick that you know you don't need to pay a, a huge amount of attention on your turn. And then bathroom is where, like, do when I come back from the bathroom, do I really care what other people have done? Um, you do. It increases with the more you, you know about the game and how, and how the gears on this game turn. But it's not, there's not so much interaction that it, it gets a full rating for me. So overall, I give this an 8. Okay. Uh, Greg? Yeah, I think... I think I just weigh the bathroom slash pop song categories much sure. heavier than Eric does. <laughs> so for me, it, I, I realize I think this is a good game for a lot of people. And uh, this is the question I asked for myself is if I had this on my shelf, would I want to pull it out? And I think there's a particular gamer that I think I know when I see them that yes, I would. Eric. Uh, you know, like, oh, this, yeah, <laughs> someone like Eric. But I don't even that, even like a person who I don't know games, but there's a certain personality type i don't know how to describe it i'm like hey this person's gonna like scythe um so for me it's a 6.5 wow. i give it yeah wow. I mean, brutal it is but at the end of the day it's just it needs more interaction that's just i that weighs so heavily that's for me it the that's the only thing that just needs more interaction it's a big deal for me and it's not if it's not going to have a lot of interaction, you need a better really, you need a better imagination greg that way, if, you, if you're more engaged with your imagination, you don't need to engage with you know, other people. You know what? If you, if you wanted to play a 1920s Eastern European diesel punk RPG, I'd be so on board with that. <laughs> All right. But the, I, I would love that, but this game doesn't do that for me. Yeah, that's it's just not my kind of game. It's just, yeah, the interaction, it's... And if it's not going to be a lot of interaction, I need the puzzle to be much heavier, just a lot more to think about if I'm going to be doing stuff by myself. And, I, and this is kind of midweight. I mean, it's just not doing anything new, I guess. It's just not doing anything that inspires me to want to pull this out over Gaia Project, if that makes sense. You know, it, it's... So that's where I'm at. But I recognize why people like it so much. And if you look at it and like, man, I want to play with those minis and this wonderful art, I say go for it. Uh, as far as our shelf, okay, I can I can settle this one pretty quick. <laughs> I've, I've, I've been thinking about this. 
Because yeah. I know what's going on the shelf, and I agree it should yeah, be. I, I will remind you that Gaia Project is not on our shelf, so. <laughs> oh, it's not. I, I, because I, I, I know Eric loves this game, and I think it's worth being on the shelf. It, it fills a particular niche that I think is valuable. But what game gets kicked off, I can solve this right now. So last time we talked about Seven Wonders, and I mistakenly said King of Tokyo also goes, to, only goes to five, but it actually goes to six. Mm. Which means we have code names, which goes to eight or above, actually, and we have um, King of Tokyo, which goes to six. Which means the only slot that Seven Wonders is filling that we don't have too many other games for is seven player. Mm. So basically, I'm because we put on Seven Wonders Duel, it just feels really silly having Seven Wonders and Seven Wonders Duel on there. So I'm willing to kick off Seven Wonders for Scythe. Okay. Eric, Problem solved. I agree. You, I'll, you I'll take that, that bargain. All right. Do not, you don't it, want it just feels dumb having. It does. I, I had thought about that already. <laughs> it's just yeah. It is a little silly. Well, I mean, I I don't know. I, I think it's it speaks to the integrity of the process. That, uh, <laughs> that uh, you know that you kept it on when it met the criteria. So all right. So I will go on to our ten game shelf. We will say goodbye. Uh, to Seven Wonders, and what are we going to talk about next time, guys? It's kind of a transition point for us, isn't it? Yeah, we're going to jump off of the uh, highly ranked games and just kind of do what we want to do a little bit uh, mm -hmm. for a while. So I think we're going to do Go next. Well, you've, we have, we'll, we'll have an interesting perspective on Go. Good to rate an extremely hot current game like Go. So. <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> Sounds like that we're going to start jumping around to uh, just uh, whatever catches our interest a little bit more as we go forward with this list, having um, at this point um, covered uh, a lot of, you know, really kind of the basic starter, you know, most popular ones. So we'll look forward to getting into some more diverse subjects as we move forward. Um, before we go, remember, uh, if you have not subscribed to us, please subscribe, like this video, uh, and if you like Greg's home address because you're a fanboy of Scythe and you want to go have a confrontation with him, uh, please leave us a note in the comments. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a better game. <laughs> <laughs> Don't believe him. He doesn't have any games. His shelf is too small. He, he can't He can't afford to put uh, games in his little pod that he lives in. So, <laughs> Sorry. Um, Alright, but uh, that'll do it for this time. Look forward next time to go. Until then, this has been a piece of the action. Yeah, I know the answer I, to this. I, I, I just want to say, I feel like those are all 60s names. <laughs> yeah, they totally are. You know, there's no... I, there's, honestly, actually, I think they're, they're more... I bet they're more 50s, because, yeah. because she was supposed to be kind of a... Well, she was supposed to be shrewish, so she's like old-fashioned, kind of, and yeah. Do you know the answer to this one, Micah? I think no. Greg and I both, both know it. No. Yeah. Do you have a guess? Um, Edith. Okay. Uh, Greg? I'm going to go with Stella. That is correct. <laughs> Let's just double check here. Uh, i got to plug it in. Okay. And Stella C. That is correct. So Stella yeah. was the shrewish right. And, and the reason that... that uh, I mean... He, because they would, oh no, no, she would say his name as she like powered up because yeah. she was a robot. She's a robot that they had at the very end. They bring her back as a as a robot, and that's his punishment for for being a truly horrible person. Harry Mudd, not a good. Yeah, he's man. a he, he is not a good person, and um and his punishment. <laughs> this is such a sixties thing. His punishment is to is to now have to live with his horrible wife. <laughs> Yeah, but they brought they got, her back uh, in the uh, Discovery. They did, yeah. He just went back with her again. I mean, that was like his punishment. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I will say, as much as I don't like Discovery, I preferred, that, that was good. I preferred Rain Wilson's take on Harry Mudd. I know Indeed. people love... I forgot that guy's name now, but I, I know people loved him, but it was just so over-the-top caricature. In the original? <laughs> Yeah, in the, the original series, yeah. every Harry there's two Harry Mudd episodes and three if you count the animated series, and right. they're both super annoying to me. They are. Just because yeah. of him, <laughs> Rain Wilson was even much better. Thought... Was much better, even though I, I agree. Discovery is not it's not a Star Trek show. 
But no, rain, but the reason did you know that that episode was a filler? Uh, well, not a filler, but they, it was like a last minute thing. That Rain Wilson episode. They had they. I don't remember the full story. You'll have to look it up. But um, it was their there best was something episode, about it opinion. was their best episode. <laughs> but it was the episode where they were like uh, something went wrong. They needed to to reach like they lost an episode or something. And they had to mm-hmm. they had to shoot one real fast, and so they decided to shoot the, but, the Harry Mudd episode. But it was he was still way darker than. The yeah. original series one, but of course that's just discovery. Everything's got to be dark and violent. But yeah. he was like a serial killer in discovery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but, so still, also still, not a still good a person. No, he's still no, he's a horrible person. Yeah. But the episode was good. The episode. Well, he was like a he was a pimp in the first. Yes. The time we you see him in Mud, Mud's Women, I think that's the first time you see him. Mm-hmm. And then the second time, what was the name of that episode with his wife? Oh, the one with the robots. Yeah. I don't um, remember. I forgot. Oh, anyway, anyway. Okay. I no. I mud or is that the animated I'm, series one? I mud. I think I mud was the animated. I'm, I don't know. I can't remember. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, but yeah, Stella. <laughs> Not a lot of Stellas yeah, these days. I remember the yeah. name Stella. Yeah, st- yeah. St- Harcourt. That's what it was. Harcourt Fenton mud. <laughs> she power up and then come after him. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> 